Well, today is the, uh, this is the weekend, let's say, of, of 4th of July. This is, tomorrow is our day that we celebrate our independence. It's the day we celebrate the Declaration of Independence. Uh, it's the day we celebrate our nation. And uh, we looked at last week, or last year, on, uh, I, I keep a record of all my sermons and go back and look at them from time to time as we come up on things like this. And one thing that we looked at last year is, is that the 4th of July really didn't have as much significance at the time as a lot of people would have thought. It, it, it wasn't when we started the battle. It wasn't when the war started. It wasn't when the war ended and we obtained our freedom. Uh, it was simply the day that we decided simply the day that our leadership or the Congress <laughs> decided that what we wanted. Why were we, we were already at war with England, what, what did we want out of that war? What did we want to obtain? What did we want to accomplish? And that's when they declared our independence and declared that that was what we were after. And we declared our in, intentions. And we looked at that last year as as the fact is, why, why do you come to church? Why do people worship God? Why do people, what do people want from God? What do we want? And that is our independence uh, from sin, our freedom from the things of the world. I'm uh, on Facebook. I've got several groups that I'm a member of that uh, a group of pastors within our association, but I'm also on a group that's of pastors uh, throughout the Southern Baptist Convention. And I was reading through some of the posts and looking at some of the things that people had uh, were looking at this week. And I was really shocked and surprised the number of pastors that said they weren't doing anything special for Independence Day. Matter of fact, they don't, they don't celebrate it at all in their church. And they don't do anything uh, they don't even recognize it within their church. And I think that that is a... They said, you know, we want, we want all of the focus to be on Christ. And I looked at that, and I thought, what a shame. What a shame that a church or that a pastor cannot look at the things that we have in this country cannot look at this nation and see the way that it's blessed and see the, the blessing that it is, but not only the blessing that it is, but how it relates to our Christianity and how we can, we can focus on Christ through other things. And it, I, as I looked at that, I thought about how, we are, uh, how we've been going through the parables of Christ. And even though today we're not going to look at one of his parables, I'm going to use it as a parable because what Jesus did is he took the everyday things and he took the things that we, we look at every day, the things that we notice or the things that, that people were involved in, and he took those things and he used it to use the things that people understood to explain things that they couldn't understand. Well, as I look at 4th of July, and I will, I will probably always focus on our 4th of July. I will probably always focus on Memorial Day. Those two especially. And the reason is, is because they are a parable of our world. We can take that, and, and to be honest, most people in the world, they can't understand the sacrifice that Jesus made. They can't, they can't see how His sacrifice, His dying on the cross, a lot of the people in the world can't see how that sacrifice or Him dying on the cross made a difference for us. But yet we can understand how all the soldiers and all those who died provided us freedom as a nation. And see, we can take that and we can take the sacrifice that people made and we can understand and see the sacrifice and that may have a greater understanding of the sacrifice that Jesus made through that as a parable. We can also, here at Independence Day, here, here at the 4th of July, I like to look at it this way. We declared our freedom 
And we declared our independence from Great Britain or from England because we were basically in bondage to them. And through our declaration and through our nation's declaration and through the battle that was waged and the battle that was fought, through that we gained our independence and we were no longer under bondage to Great Britain. And that is a perfect example of how we can look at Christ and Him giving us our freedom. So today as we go, I want to look at what Jesus said as He read from Scripture in Luke chapter 4. <coughs> in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, it says, So He came to Nazareth, where He had been brought up. And as His custom was, He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recover the sight to the blind. He set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all who bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth, and they said, Is this not Joseph's son? Lord, we thank you this morning for, your, for the liberties. We thank you, Lord, for the freedom that you provide to us. Lord, the freedom that we have to come and to worship you. The freedom we have, Lord, to, uh, to be freed from sin. And we thank you, Lord, for that, that you provide it. In your name we pray. Amen. Now this scripture was, this, this actually happened real early in his ministry. As a matter of fact, you back up there a little bit in, in Luke and you see that this was right after he was baptized and right after he went into the wilderness and right after he was tempted of Satan. This is one of the first things that happened to him. This is the, one of the first things that we have recorded in his ministry as he returns and he comes back to his hometown. Now his hometown, uh, this is one of the things that I found out while I was over in Israel is, is where Nazareth was. Uh, or what Nazareth was. Nazareth was actually just a very, very small town. It was a very, very small settlement more than a town uh, would, be, would be more accurate. And it was a tradesman's village. Uh, you know that, that Joseph was a carpenter. And basically the people that lived in Nazareth were all tradesmen. They were all uh, some sort of craftsmen or tradesmen. Because in that time period, they were building the city of Tiberias, which was along the Sea of Galilee. Matter of fact, it's the biggest, the biggest city that is, that is in Galilee still today is Tiberias. Matter of fact, they even named the Sea of Galilee. If you go there now, uh, it's not called the Sea of Galilee. It's called Lake Tiberias. And uh, this was at the time that they were building the city of Tiberias, so therefore there was a lot of craftsmen, there was a lot of carpenters, stonemasons, uh, different different things that, that they used back in those days, the ornamental work and all that, and, and basically around the Sea of Galilee you had different settlements to build this, uh, this city. See, uh, Nazareth was considered to be one of those areas, so this was, a, this was an area that was full of the working class people. These were not these were not your city leaders. These were not your uh, your your. Uh, you didn't have many uh, uh, politicians or anything like that. You had craftsmen. You had tradesmen. You had working class people who lived there, and they were just common folk. And Jesus came back to this area, and they had a synagogue there. And, and I'm imagining that their synagogue that they had was nothing. Nothing very fancy, but it was just a, a basically a place to worship. 
Now, in some areas you had real fancy synagogues. In some areas you had just huts or houses. But it was the place set aside to worship. Now, a small commercial break here. I want to I point out where Jesus was on the Sabbath. He was in the synagogue. He was in the place that was set aside to worship at the time that was set aside to worship. And we have people today and... and, and you know, it's, it's easy to find an excuse. It's easy to find a reason not to come to church. It's easy to it's easy sometimes to 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 get out of the habit. It's easy it's easy to look around and say, well, you know what? That person don't like me. These people don't like me. These people these people are hateful to me. These people do this or the. Let me tell you something. In the synagogues around Israel, they wanted to kill Jesus. And eventually did. They hated him. They hated the things that he stood for. They hated the things that he said. They, they saw every opportunity to, to belittle him. They saw every, every opportunity to entrap him. But through it all, every Sabbath, every time that it was time to be in church, Jesus was in church. He didn't care what the people thought of him. He didn't care what they, what they said about him. He was in church. Now, when he went to church, he didn't just go and sit back. He didn't just go and sit. He didn't just go and, and say, bless me. He came to church and he participated. He was involved. And matter of fact, his custom was is that, that he was going to be involved in church. He was going to take, take an active role in the synagogue. And he came and he, he took the scripture and he read from the book of Isaiah. Now this, what he read was actually found in Isaiah chapter 61. If you look at Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2 is where you'll see what he read. Now what he said was, as he read this in Isaiah, which by the way, was written almost 700 years prior to him reading this. And what he read was about him. Imagine reading something and going, going and picking up a book that is about you that was written 700 years before you were born. Well, that's what Jesus did. And he read from this book, and here's what it said. It said that he, he was anointed by God to preach the gospel to the poor. He was also brought in to heal the brokenhearted. He was anointed by God to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives, recover the sight to the blind, set liberty to those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now these are the things that he said that God anointed him to do. These are the things that he said that he was, he was his purpose. These are the things. Now we know as we, as we look at this, this is the purpose of Jesus coming to their world. Now, we all say that Jesus came to die and save us from our sins. That's true. Here's how he did it. These are the things. It said, he said, this is what God sent me, what God anointed me to do. Now, as he read this, he said, it, this was talking pre-Jesus' birth. But yet, he, he's, when he sat down, he said, and today this is brought into your sight. Today, this is, it, today you can actually see this happen. But here's what he's doing. He, he came to preach the gospel. Folks, this is exactly the same thing that we are to do. Jesus came to spread the good news. And the thing is, gospel actually means good news. And it's the good news of Jesus Christ. So here he says, I have come to preach or to spread the good news about me. I've come to tell you who I am. I've come to tell you how you can know me, how you can have me. He came to heal the brokenhearted. We all have have broken heartedness. We all, you know, that, that when I when I type this up, and word says that broken heartedness is not a word, but it really it, it is broken heartedness. Maybe that's not really a word, but but that's what he came to heal is our broken heartedness. Listen, if we have grief, if we have sorrows, we have hardships. That is being broken hearted, and he came to heal those things. He came, to, he came to do that. Now, he, 
To recover the sight to the blind. You notice I skipped one there. We'll get back to that. Recover the sight to the blind. We're all blinded to something. We're all blinded to the ways of the world. We're all blinded to something in our life. And, and, and he, is, he is to give us the sight. Not only the sight, physical sight, but so that He can open our eyes to the things going on around us. He can open the, our eyes to the ways of God. And we see these things. He's also came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Folks, these are the things that we are to be doing as well. Preaching the gospel. Helping those who are broken hearted. Helping people open their eyes, but then to proclaim the coming of Jesus. Proclaim His second coming. Now when we do those things, that's when we go back, and that's when we proclaim the liberty. That is freedom. That is the freedom to the captives. Let me tell you something. We are all held captive. The world is held captive by sin. We are, we are told all through that, that sin enslaves us. Sin, sin enslaves people. And he says that he has come to offer us freedom or the liberty from that that captivates us. The thing and our captivity is sin. But Jesus came to free us from that. Now he does that through the preaching of the gospel, through the healing of the brokenhearted, through the opening of the eyes. But he's also, he bring, notice though that liberty, he says that he came to bring liberty. He brought, said that twice. Once to the captives and once to those who are oppressed. Let me tell you something. Sin both captivates you, it, or it keeps you captive, and it also oppresses you. And through Jesus, we have liberty. He brings that liberty to us. Now, in John chapter 8, we see that he says in verse 32, it says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And as I look at that, this, let me tell you something, this, this reminds me of America. You start talking, hey, I'm an American, I'm free. That's the same thing that the children of Abraham said. That's the same thing that the Israelites said. Hey, we're, we're descendants of Abraham. We're not in bondage to anybody. What do you mean make us free? Let me tell you something. The truth is what makes you free. You are not made free because you're an American. You, you may be free from some stuff, but let me tell you something. Our government oppresses you just as much as it frees you. We are slaves to sin. Jesus made that clear that we are saved to, slaves to sin. Nothing frees us but Jesus. Now, let me tell you something. We live, and I've heard a lot of negativity, and there's a lot of things negative about our nation. There's a lot of things that we can say. I don't think I've ever been more proud in the past couple of weeks to be an American. Let me tell you something. Under a democratic Congress, under a democratic president, under a democratic Senate, we overturned Roe v. Wade. Not only did we overturn Roe v. Wade, but we also got a freedom and I've heard, saw a lot of people posted and they've been getting it wrong. They say that, that, that teachers have the right now to, to lead prayer in school, and they don't. And, and I'm, I'm glad for that. I, re, I really am, because I don't want somebody else leading our children uh, because who knows what they're leading them in. But the thing is, is as a teacher, a teacher has the, the, the right 
and to, to, to sit down and pray in school. A, a, a teacher or a, a, a coach has the right to kneel down on the, on the football field or on a basketball court or wherever and pray because that, it is determined that that is their constitutional right and their freedom of speech. And let me tell you something, that made me proud when I saw these things. To, and especially to happen while we're while we're our leaders of today right now are are as oppressive as they can be. They are trying to oppress us, and yet we just gained some freedom that that some thought we would never again see. And that made me, like I said, that made me proud to be an American because here's the thing: our government is oppressive. Yes, we have, we have certain freedoms. But try not paying your taxes and see if you're really free. You know, we, we've got people since, since some of these court, they're saying how since some of these court cases came down, they're, they're talking about uh, how that our, our how that we're trying to to control their bodies and control their them. And let me tell you something. We just gained freedom for a new generation. We just gained freedom from the government telling us, directing us what to do. And and it's never as I look at that and I see being American is not why I'm free. Being American does not make you free. Only the truth, which is Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus said? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Only the truth is what makes us free. When we understand the truth, when we accept the truth, and when we recognize the truth, and that is the truth of Him died and crucified and raised again, only that is what sets us free, not being American. Now this is, we can understand it, we can see it, we can, we can recognize it through our independence and through our declaration of independence, but yet we cannot really understand and know truth until we know Jesus Christ. And like I said, a lot of people, they, they want to take those freedoms. And they, they feel like if, if we say we're free and we recognize our freedom, they want to take these freedoms and say that we can, we can do with our body what we want to do. We can do what we want to do since we're free and nobody going to tell us what to do. Let me tell you something. The freedom that Jesus provides for us is not a freedom to make our own decisions. Not a freedom to just do whatever we want to do. You see, He tells us, we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, all things, this is, this is Paul talking, he said, all things are lawful for me. But all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I will not let the law determine what I do. I will not let the laws of man, I will not let the laws of this nation determine whether or not I worship God. Now it is great that we have been given these, that, that our Supreme Court has come along and said, yeah, you can do these things. But let me tell you something. I didn't need the Supreme Court to tell me whether I could pray or not. I didn't need the Supreme Court. Thank, thank God that we have, we have coaches out there, we have teachers out there that took it to the Supreme Court, that, that didn't care if they had the right or not, didn't care whether the law said they could or not. They went ahead and did it and got it brought to the Supreme Court. Thank God for men and women who are willing to do that. Just because it's the law. I'm not going to be brought under the law of man if it goes against the law of God. See, I have that freedom through God, not through America, not through our government. Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 tells us, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You see, these freedoms that we have, you got a lot of people that say, because I'm free, I'll do what I want to do. 
because I'm free. And there's a big debate. There's always been a big debate, especially within the Southern Baptist and within, within Baptist altogether. We have the debate about the sovereignty of God versus the free will of man. Let me tell you something. We do have a free will. God gives us the choice. And He gives us that freedom. But, he's, but Paul tells us here, be careful about that freedom. Be careful about the freedoms that you have. That you don't misuse it. That you don't take it and do what... Take that freedom that you have and just do your own thing. Because if you do that, it's not really freedom. It's bondage. You see, we mistake freedom for bondage. When we say that we're free and we use that to do things that are ungodly, and we do that, we take that and we use what we claim as freedom to do things that goes against God, we're proving our bondage to sin. See, true freedom is serving Christ. True, free, true, true freedom is actually bondage to Him. Because He frees us from sin's bondage. He frees us from the world. That's what true freedom is. It don't come from any nation. It doesn't come from any, any government. It doesn't come from any law. True freedom only comes. And as we celebrate our freedom, we celebrate today or tomorrow being... Independence Day and it's a great day to celebrate our nation and I love to celebrate our nation. You know, I, 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 I truly believe that we still live in the greatest nation in the world. <coughs> I've, traveled, I've traveled to several different nations. I've traveled to several different countries and you cannot, you, you, there's just not an argument to say that we don't live in the greatest nation in the world. But we live in the greatest nation of the world because this nation was blessed by God. This nation was founded upon God. And when, as it, if we allow it to turn from God, then it will no longer be the greatest nation. And it's been well on its way, but we saw this, we saw in the past couple of weeks that it, it can be brought back. And let me tell you something I've, I've heard and I've seen and I've Donald Trump is not the savior of this nation. Now, I'd rather see him than what we've got. I don't want to get too political. But I, but I will say this. He is not the savior of this nation. We don't need... And, and I've heard pastors and I've seen churches and, you know, go on and on about Donald Trump. And, 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 and he did some great things. And I, I, I'm glad that he was able to nominate the three people that he did to the Supreme Court. But let me tell you something. We need to depend on God, not Donald Trump, in this coming election. I don't know if he's going to run or not. I've heard yes and no, but here's the thing. Our freedom doesn't come through him. Our freedom doesn't come through who gets elected to the, to the White House. Our freedom will only come through Christ. Amen. And we need to continually remember that and continually pray that God will continue to bless this nation. This morning as we come, the time of invitation, it's simple. If you're here this morning and you don't know freedom, you think you know freedom, you, you, because, you've been in, because you're in America, because you were raised uh, free, maybe because the nation, your nation's free, you think you're free. But listen, if you don't know Christ, you're still in bondage. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then I invite you this morning to come and know Him. If you know Him this morning, though, I want you to I want you to, to recognize and understand what true freedom is. And I want you to, to take this week, take, take tomorrow, and use it as a time to thank God. Not thank our nation, not just watch fireworks and have a cookout, but to thank God for the freedom that He provides. And take this opportunity to pray for this nation. And pray that God will continue to bless America as we stand. Lord, we thank You this morning.
for your blessings. And we thank you, Lord, for the nation that you've given us. And we just